Hi, this is your favorite internet celebrity. Last month, I was invited to give a talk at a tech conference in Munich called the Big Tech Day 22 by the folks at TNG Technology Consulting. I chose to give my talk on the science behind speedrunning with an emphasis on tool-assisted speedruns. This was my first official appearance as a YouTuber and my very first experience with public speaking. You're going to see the full talk with the Q&A session at the end. Enjoy! All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the presentations, uh, speed running video uh, games as a gateway to scientific uh, endeavors. Our speaker is Gabriel Girard. He's also known online as Bismuth, and he is a video game uh, speedrunner and video producer. Um, through his YouTube channel, he found a way uh, to combine two of his passions, uh, science communication and video game speedrunning. His uh, channel fo uh, his channel mostly features uh, explanations of, uh, uh, of world-class speedrunning achievements. These videos are typically called Speedrun Explained, and they break down the uh, achievements of the speedruns for the casual viewer uh, to understand the, uh, the speedruns and appreciate the effort behind them. <coughs> um, these, uh, these mini documentaries include a healthy dose of entry-level computer uh, science because they describe how tiny imperfections in the, um, in the inner mechanics of the retro video games are exploited and they allow the players to complete the video games incredibly fast. Um, although his days of setting world records may begun, Gabriel is rapidly becoming one of the most well-known and respected figures of the ever-growing speedrunning community as an educator and an entertainer. So, welcome uh, everyone, Gabriel, to the stage. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so, uh, yes, my name is uh, Gabriel Girard. This is uh, speedrunning video games as a gateway to scientific endeavors. Uh, so, if you if you're not quite sure what that means. Don't worry, we'll get to that. Uh, first, a few words about me. Uh, thanks to Gehar for the uh, introduction. So as you may know, I'm a YouTuber. Uh, so I make uh, these uh, 30 to 45 minutes, uh, minute videos about speedrunning and about uh, top level speedruns and tool assisted speedruns. And what they do basically is they break down everything that's going on and they, uh, they break down all the, all the tricks, everything that might be uh, kind of obscure for someone who doesn't know the, the game that well. And so by the end of the video, you generally have a better understanding of the game, better understanding of the speedrun, and what uh, the effort that uh, went into it. So um, today's presentation, uh, first of all, before we get into it, I think the most important thing is to define what is a speedrun. So uh, a speedrun is a playthrough of a video game with the goal of completing an objective as fast as possible. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, the objective is usually going to be to beat the game, like there's a final level, there's a final boss, there's usually an ending, uh, but the objective can be any uh, like self-set uh, thing. You might want to either uh, like uh, collect every item in the game, or you could uh, set yourself a, a different difficulty setting or anything. It could be a single level. The idea is just that you do whatever objective as fast as possible. If you're doing that, you're speedrunning. Um, so today's presentation, there will be uh, two main points I want to I want to explain. First one, speedrunning is more scientific than you think. Uh, it's video games, so usually it's often associated with like leisure and something that's not really productive. But uh, there are some scientific elements to speedrunning that we can uh, we can explore. And the second one, uh, speedrunning has some educational potential. Uh, so I'm going to eventually get to that. But those are the two main points that uh, we're going to cover. To get to that, though, we need a bit more context. So uh, first of all, we'll see a bit of uh, definition and history of speedrunning. And then uh, we'll see wh uh, what tool-assisted speedruns are, or TAS. I'm going to say TAS for short a lot. So a TAS means a tool-assisted speedrun. Um, and then we'll see the tasking process. And uh, we'll talk about three TAS examples that I think are pretty interesting uh, for different reasons. And uh, then um, we're going to see what happens when a task takes complete control over the game. This is like the ultimate cool thing you can do with a task. Uh, so this is more like the section that will cover the part about uh, speedrunning is more scientific than you think. And then the second section, we'll see 
uh, glitch hunting and the scientific method. So glitches are essentially bugs in the game, and they can be pretty useful in speedrunning. And so uh, trying to find them and trying to understand them is very valuable. And finally, uh, we'll see a little bit about how uh, everything uh, in speedrunning has some potential as an introduction to scientific endeavors. Um, so usually, when people learn about speedrunning, the next question they have is, why would you speedrun? Because usually, uh, a game, when you play a game, you have like 20, 30, 50, and maybe even 100 hours worth of playtime. And if you're speedrunning it, you might get through the entire game in just an hour or even less. The question is, why would you do that? Why don't you enjoy the game instead? Well, the first reason is replayability, because uh, speedrunners are often seen as people who rush through the game and don't enjoy it. But the reality is, oftentimes, they've played the game many, many, many times before. And if you've played a game enough times, even if it's a game you love, when it runs out of content, when nothing else is new, it just becomes stale, no matter how you look at it. But speedrunning lets you um, uh, play the game over and over, but in a way that is interesting every time, because you're trying to achieve something, and you're trying to, be uh, to beat your best time. And so there comes the second point, self-improvement. Uh, it's a little bit similar to uh, how uh, individual sports work, uh, like cycling or running, where you have your personal best, and your goal is just to try to beat it. Uh, that's essentially uh, what you're doing in speedrunning, except obviously the media is different. Uh, and then you have also competition, because speedrunning is a pretty large community, and there's a bunch of people also doing it. And so when you're trying to beat your record, you eventually try to beat others' records. You can race people, and you can try to challenge the world record if you want. Uh, and again, speedrunning has a very large community. We'll get a little more into that. Uh, but uh, this is another good reason. You can make a lot of good friends. I've made a lot of good friends in the speedrunning community. And finally, it's a very easy hobby to get into. Uh, so long as you have a video game, all you need is your video game and a timer. You can start speedrunning. So um, the community is now really large. And I wanted to just show you a little bit how it got there, uh, just so we get a bit more context about why speedrunning is so big now. Uh, so in the mid-90s, before the mid-90s, uh, speedrunning was not really a thing. People who were uh, competitive about video games were mostly playing arcade games and trying to compete for high scores. But that changed around 96, 97 with the release of these four games, uh, Quake, Super Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, and GoldenEye 007. So uh, with those games, uh, people started uh, creating websites where people could submit times to various challenges. Um, and so those websites evolved. They all actually still exist today. And so communities starting, uh, started forming around these games. Uh, at first, it was just a couple dozen people. Nowadays, these communities are usually made up of uh, multiple hundred people. Uh, but they, that, that was the start of like, officially speedrunning as being a community thing. And then a few years later, around 2003 to 2005, uh, that's when some uh, weird videos started popping up on the internet and went viral about extremely high-skilled players uh, speedrunning video games. As it turns out, those were tool-assisted speedruns, but people didn't know about them at the time. It just looked like someone who was inhumanly good at the game. And so those videos went really viral and exposed speedrunnings to uh, millions of new eyes. And then a few years later, uh, with the advent of Twitch, uh, came the era of live streaming. So now uh, the process wasn't, the, the, uh, the interest wasn't as much as watching the final speedrun, but watching the process of speedrunning, watching the attempts, watching the practice, uh, seeing how people got better. And then um, a year later, uh, the very first charity event called Games Done Quick was done in 2010. And over the years, it's been done twice a year. And it's grown to massive numbers now with thousands of attendees, raising about 6 million US dollars uh, per year to uh, two charity foundations. And uh, then a few years later, 2015, that was the creation of speedrun.com, which is a leaderboards website. And uh, essentially, this website just uh, gathered everyone on a central hub where every leaderboard was available. You could see the world records, everyone's times. And so from there, the community could only grow even larger. Uh, as of today, in 2022, on speedrun.com, you have 1 million uh, users, 1 million speedrunners. Uh, and they have done 3 million speedruns on 27,000 games. So this is the size of the community. It's gone from a very niche part of a niche hobby to a pretty major part of a very mainstream hobby. Um, with, a community this, with a community this large, uh, there are different roles people can take. And there are two of them that are especially relevant for today. Uh, so the first one, spectators. Uh, so those are the most casual, the most uh, 
the most uh, numerous. Uh, there are people who just watch speedruns on YouTube, on Twitch, or at live events like uh, this audience at a Games Done Quick event. Then you have uh, regular speedrunners. Those are the people who do the speedruns, take up a game, try to beat their time, and then even challenge world records. This is uh, a former Super Mario Brothers world record holder. And um, basically, uh, those people are just defined by uh, the dedication to the game, the practice, the patience, a lot of patience. And then um, you have glitch hunters. So this is a little more of the scientific process. Uh, so those people will try to find bugs and glitches in the game and try to improve the general speedrun with new techniques and tricks. And finally, this is the final evolution of the speedrunner Pokemon type, tool assisted speedrunners. Uh, essentially, uh, those people are mythical beings who play the game perfectly and the result is absolutely fascinating. Um, so what is a tool assisted speedrun? I think it's time we explain that. Uh, so a tool assisted speedrun, uh, or TAS for short, is a set sequence of controller inputs that completes an objective in a game while optimizing for time. As you can see, the, uh, the definition is pretty close to a speedrun. The main difference is that while a speedrun is a performance, a tool-assisted speedrun is actually a creation. So it's something that you, it's a project that you work on for uh, multiple hours, days, months, depending on the scope, it can be even years, and the result is a sequence of controller buttons. And if you play that sequence on a, uh, while the game is playing, you can essentially complete the game or complete the objective you set yourself. Um, and usually the goal is to optimize that sequence so it's as short as possible, so you can beat the game as fast as possible. It's very comparable to a player piano, which are mechanical pianos with rolls of paper with holes in them. And the holes essentially tell the piano which note to play. And if you have the correct roll of paper, the, you can hear songs, you can hear anything you want. So if you just punch the holes, you create your, your song. The exact same thing is happening for tool-assisted speedruns. You're creating a sequence of buttons, and then once you play that sequence back, the game is going to beat itself. Uh, so the tool part of tool-assisted speedrun can be a little cryptic. So uh, here are the main ones. Uh, so the first one is an emulator, because you will need these other tools. You need emulators to run them. Uh, and the two main tools you need for testing is uh, safe states and frame advance. So the emulator would look a bit like this. And you can see when you're testing uh, here, you can see that you can play the game very slowly. You can use safe states. You can uh, basically redo everything. You can try a bunch of stuff until you get the result you want. So it sort of turns the game from a game that you play in a real time with controller into a puzzle, where the solution is to try to do whatever you wanted to do as fast as possible. And finally, the last tool that's, uh, that really lets you elevate your speedrun to the next level is Memory Watch. Uh, this is one of the very advanced tools for Memory Watch, but essentially, uh, Memory Watch lets you see a bunch of information about the game, a bunch of variables, uh, everything you need to know to uh, manipulate enemies or manipulate randomness or manipulate anything you want to really achieve your needs. Um, so with these tools in hand, you can try to uh, answer the, the question, the main question that tool-assisted speedrunning tries to answer, which is, what is the perfect speedrun? That's essentially the goal. Uh, but uh, there's also another subset of tasking uh, where instead of speedrunning, uh, the S stands for superplay. So a tool-assisted superplay acronym is the same, so they're kind of used interchangeably sometimes. Uh, but you can ask the alternate question, how can we break the game in the most entertaining way possible? Uh, we're going to see a little bit of both. Uh, we're mostly focusing on speedruns, but there's a lot of super plays that are very interesting, and I thought it was a pretty uh, good thing to showcase today. Um, so the question, what is the perfect speedrun, is usually extremely difficult to answer. Uh, I could only find a very few specific examples of uh, cases where the question is actually answered. One of them is on a game called Dragster on the Atari 2600. It's a very old game. I think it's 45 years old by now. Uh, and it's a very simple game. But the perfect speedrun uh, was uh, mathematically solved and proven by Omnigamer, or Eric Kosiel, who also wrote a book on speedrunning called Speedrun Science. I recommend it if uh, you, uh, if you uh, yeah. So I, I recommend that book. <laughs> uh, so basically, Omnigamer uh, solved that, uh, that the question for this game. He created a spreadsheet that essentially simulates the game state and found a, a series of buttons that you could do that could beat the game. And he found a way to do those buttons that was actually feasible in real time. And therefore, he was the first person 
to do um, uh, with a real controller with video proof uh, uh, the perfect time of dragster. And here it is. So there it was, 5.57. This is the perfect speedrun of Dragster. And uh, the buttons he did uh, through that speedrun were perfectly planned, and it was exactly what he wanted to do. And that was exactly what he needed to do, to do 5.57. Um, so I wanted to show you another example uh, in Super Mario 64. So uh, in Dragster, that's a very simple game, can be solved. But in Super Mario 64, that's uh, one of the first 3D games. And so um, the question becomes impossible to answer. I wanted to show you a bit of an example of what I mean by that. So when you're just trying to go from point A to point B in Super Mario 64, it should be pretty simple, right? It, especially if you're going in a straight line right ahead of Mario. So I put a star somewhere, and then Mario is trying to reach it as fast as possible. The thing is, uh, Mario 64 has a bunch of different movement options, and some of them might be better than others. So to reach that star, here's what you can do. Uh, you can uh, run directly to the star and jump into it. You can use long jumps instead. If you want, you can use uh, dive rolls. You can use slide kicks. You can do a trick called the speed kicks. That it lets you conserve some speed. If you jump too early, you'll lose some speed, so that loses time. And if you jump too late, then you fall for longer after getting the star, and that also loses time. And finally, the one last thing you can do is you can ground pound under the star, and then that lets you fall to the ground faster. So these are a bunch of options, and then the question becomes, what's the fastest? Well, the thing is, depending on the situation, if the star is closer, if the star is further away, if the star is higher or lower or off to one side or somewhere, and if Mario is going faster, depending on Mario's speed as well, the answer will change. The answer will never be the same. So you have to try these things. You have to figure out what's the fastest movement option in every single situation. So when the question becomes, what's the perfect speed run of Mario 64, the answer is incredibly complicated because this is the simplest example and the answer is still unclear. Um, I wanted to show uh, one example of how complicated this can become. Uh, this is called the Everlips, uh, named after uh, one of the people who was involved in the problem. Essentially, it represents Mario's uh, possible, uh, the range of Mario's possible positions after a certain amount of frames, one frame being the smallest unit of time in the game. Uh, so in Mario 64, that represents 1 30th of a second. So as you can see here, those are the different positions Mario can take after 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 12 frames. And uh, those positions can be achieved by tilting the control stick. And the uh, equation you see above it is the equation for the optimal control stick angle if you're trying to achieve a point that's a little off to the side. And that equation was mathematically proven, this mathematical proof. Uh, please memorize it, because this will be on the test afterwards. Uh, so this is just an idea of how complicated this can become. And this is very advanced math. And uh, the, the question was re really, really simple. I'm trying to go from point A to point B, but point B is not directly in front of me. What do I do? So um, th this is just to give you an idea of how complicated tasking can be if you really want to try to be perfect. Uh, when you're trying to do the, the, when you're trying to create your tasks, uh, there's a process involved. So usually uh, the first three steps come before anything has been done. Uh, so the first step is researching, and then you have some planning and routing. Planning and routing kind of go hand in hand. And then once you've done these steps, you can actually start creating your tasks. So then it comes creating the actual button inputs. And then once those inputs are created, uh, you make sure to optimize them and refine them until you really get the, the results you want. And then once you think you have the best thing you could do, uh, then you verify it. By verifying it, you play back the inputs. You make sure everything is syncing up well. Because sometimes with emulators, the care, the, there can be some issues. And then when you play it back, there's something that happens that wasn't exactly like, um, like something changed. And eventually, your whole sequence desyncs. And everything after that point is worthless. You have to redo it. Uh, and the ultimate part of verifying is to play back those button presses uh, using special tools. You can plug them into actual physical consoles with the real cartridge. And then you can, uh, you can watch your, your tool-assisted speedrun actually play back and beat the game uh, as intended. So uh, the researching part is glitch hunting. So um, we're going to dedicate a, a later section of the talk on glitch hunting itself. But 
The idea of glitch hunting is to find bugs in the game. Uh, Speedrunning usually abuses uh, bugs and glitches in the game to uh, achieve the goal faster. Uh, there are some uh, speedruns that uh, ban the use of glitches, so uh, there's something for everyone if you don't like them, but uh, generally it's, more, it's a more popular thing to do to uh, include glitches in your run. So these things can, for example, be wall jumping in uh, Mario Brothers 1, where Mario clips inside the a block for a 60th of a second, and if you time your jump right, you can jump on that 60th of a second. Or a very common one, uh, backwards long jumping in Super Mario 64, can be used to skip the infinite stairs, for example. So those are essentially the thing you're trying to find. And when you do the research part, you essentially uh, find uh, what, uh, what tools you have in your tool set to create your speed run, what tricks are available, what glitches are available, what you can do to optimize your time. Uh, once that part is done, the next part becomes routing. Um, for routing, it can be pretty complicated or pretty simple. It all depends on the game. I wanted to show you a pretty good example of how routing can also be solved with, uh, with pretty complicated methods. So uh, this is uh, Trackmania, a racing game. Uh, over here, this is a map, a pretty complicated track with lots of checkpoints. In total, there are 25 checkpoints. So you have to go through all 25 and then go to the finish. Um, because this is a pretty complicated track, uh, there are different ways, different shortcuts you could take to go between one checkpoint to another checkpoint. And so uh, one Trackmania player, Jav, decided to uh, create this table. This table essentially, uh, what it's doing is it's, uh, it's a heat map with uh, the time it takes to go from one checkpoint to another. Uh, a lot of them are grayed out. Those are the ones that aren't really useful or impossible. But everything with a value and a color, uh, it's the time it takes to go from one to the other. And then uh, he created an algorithm that essentially creates the traveling salesman problem which is a common optimization problem where you have a graph of different points and you're trying to uh, find the shortest path that goes through every single point in the graph and optimizes the solution. So this is the algorithm. Uh, it's solving the uh, traveling salesman pro uh, problem for um, all 25 checkpoints. And eventually the solution that was found was uh, just about 30 seconds faster than uh, the current world record at the time. And so uh, eventually the uh, strategy that was found was actually achieved in real time by players. And so after uh, all of this work, the real time world record dropped from almost four minutes to about three and a half minutes, dropped by 26 seconds uh, thanks to these advancements. Uh, but in the case of that specific track though, um, this is the modern tool assisted speedrun of it. Uh, there were some glitches that were found recently and uh, that uh, essentially revolutionized track mania tasking. So nowadays a task of track mania doesn't quite look like uh, what you would see uh, a regular, regular person playing. Uh, so yeah. So this task essentially beats the track in about a minute and a half now. Uh, yeah. Nowadays it's a it's a little bit different. So once you've done your planning, uh, the next step is to actually create your task. So uh, the this is the tedious part. It's, uh, it, it can be very long to do. What you want to do is you play the game frame by frame. So you advance by the single, uh, single smallest unit of time that the game can run at. It's usually 30 or 60 per second. Um, so uh, your workflow would look a bit like this. You've got your emulator. You've got over here some advanced input stuff and information. You can, uh, you can input any single joystick position and any single button. And then once you have your selection, you can advance by one frame, see what happens. If it's not something you like, you can go back using safe states, and then you can repeat that process to try to try every possibility and keep the best solution. Uh, and over there, again, you've got your memory watch. Every, inf every piece of information you might need to try to achieve that goal is there. Um, so when you're trying to do this, uh, this tool-assisted speedrun, uh, usually, when you try to do a whole game, that can take a while. So typically, a project will take months to complete. So when you spend months on a project, something happens. New discoveries obsolete your past work. Something else is found. Someone finds a weird glitch, and, and everything you've done doesn't include that glitch, and it could be very, very useful to use it. So um, the problem with that is 
let's say that uh, it's a simple game with levels. You're in level seven in your problem, in your, in your process. And uh, a discovery was made that makes uh, level one significantly faster. The thing is, if you want to try to include that new discovery in your task, you can't just go back and edit level one to include the new things and then copy paste everything else you've done from that point because the game state will be a little different. Uh, usually, the, one of the main culprits is that uh, games use random numbers, uh, random number generators, and so if that random number is slightly different, then any pattern supposed to be random, like enemy moving or anything really, uh, will be influenced by that number, and so the game will behave differently now that you've changed something. And so everything you've done past level one is now worthless. What you have to do is you start over to implement those discoveries. When you start over, you complete the cycle. You spend months on your project, new discoveries are done, you have to start over, and you're stuck in an endless loop that will never see the, day, uh, the light of day. So if you want to actually complete your tasks, you have to break out of the cycle. You have to accept that the run will never be perfect. And once you make that decision, once you understand that the goal is to, tr to strive towards a perfect speed run, but the question is too complex to answer, there will always be something new to improve, uh, then you can actually complete your task. When you do complete your task, the result looks like black magic. Um, so I wanted to show you three examples of it. Uh, so the first one is going to be just a short example, uh, just to show you a little bit of what a super play can look like. So it's going to try to break the game in a very entertaining way. Second one will be how complex the optimization problem can become. Uh, it's going to be using Super Mario 64, because I think it's a very easy game to visually understand. And then the last one, we'll see some uh, crazy possibilities that a task can unlock. So first one is a task of brain age. That's a classic in the speedrunning community. It's about 10 years old. The idea, it's uh, re really simple. It's just asking you a bunch of questions. You're trying to answer it quickly. And the game has a stylus that you can write the numbers with. And it has some recognition to try to figure out what you're, what you're drawing and the numbers it represents. So here you're drawing 32, the answer to 4 times 8. The task approaches it a little differently. <clears throat> 4 plus 6 equals Mario. 2 minus 2 equals Luigi. Now we got 3 times 9, and the answer is Kirby. 8 times 4, Pikachu. So there you go, you got a bunch of them. Uh, essentially, the task, is, the task um, completely uh, subverts your expectations. Instead of writing the actual answer, it's, it's drawing something, and then the game somehow interprets that as being the correct answer. <clears throat> Um, so what's going on here, it's basically abusing the number uh, recognition algorithm. Uh, it's a pretty bare bones one, uh, something like this, for example. Uh, the, uh, some part of the drawing is seen as the number. Uh, I don't know exactly all the details about it. I don't want to explain all the details about it, but essentially it's what it's doing. The tasker found a, a, a drawing that gets interpreted as the right answer, and so that's what they're using to, um, to uh, do their, the, the answer. So here's 24, where the 2 is a L and the 4 is just a point. And finally, 45, where, of course, you would... I don't, I don't think you need highlighting to understand, but uh, it, it was still done. So this is how a super play can really uh, completely break the game in unintended ways. Now, a second task example is how complex optimization can become. And here, we're going to do Super Mario 64. So um, there's uh, essentially Super Mario 64, there are three levels to the castle and you need a key to access the next one. It's a pretty simple concept. Uh, but uh, the basement, which normally requires the first key, uh, also has a door uh, outside the castle. The problem is uh, the door is underwater, and Mario can't open doors underwater, and it's the, the whole area is covered with water, so there's no way to approach it from behind either. Uh, but um, usually, you would have to go in the basement first and then lower the water, and then you can use that door. There's a way to open it anyway, and it's a bit complicated, but if you could do it, you could skip the first key. You could skip about 40 seconds. So, uh, tool-assisted speedrunners decided to, tr decided to uh, try and solve the problem. Uh, so, they managed to beat the game in 4 minutes and 15 seconds, but the project took 16 authors and 170,000 re-records. That means when you're doing a safe state, 
uh, you are, uh, every time you're reloading a previous save state to try something else, that's a re-record, and uh, your emulator can count them. That's roughly the amount they use to create that four-minute speedrun. And the project took over a year of work. That's including uh, theorizing the strategy, researching, doing everything that was needed to eventually make the final product. And it was gradually refined over the years. The first time was about 421, but uh, over the next three, four years, some people found some minor optimizations. Uh, so I'm going to show just a small section of it, and uh, I'm going to try to give you a little play-by-play, -play, but then we, we're going to have to dive deeper to see what, what's going on. So um, we're skipping ahead a little bit. Mario is entering a stage. Uh, no need to explain how that happened, but um, so the first thing Mario's going to do is gonna, he's going to go to an elevator, and then he's going to use a trick to gain some speed, and then he's going to exit that stage, and he's going to be in water. So this is where he gains some speed, exits the stage, now he's in water, and now don't blink because some magic's going to happen. Where is Mario? There he is, in the door. All right. Uh, actually, I, I think everyone understood, so we can skip the explanation part. <laughs> Um, so backwards long jumping, that's uh, the trick that's going on here. Uh, so uh, when Mario long jump, his speed is multiplied by 1.5, but the negative speed is uncapped. I think I might need to loop this uh, video so you can see it better. All right, <clears throat> so um, the, uh, when, uh, when you're trying to do a forwards long jump, the forward speed will be capped at 48, but the negative speed is, is not directly capped, so you can keep multiplying it, and it's exponential, it reaches big numbers re really quickly. How much speed does he get? Well, he gets uh, a total of, this is not working, he gets a total of negative 3,460,233 speed. Uh, that's a lot of speed. Now, what you're trying to do with that speed, uh, you have to understand a little bit of how um, the game calculates Mario's horizontal speed. The first method is uh, the regular horizontal speed. It's a number. It's simply applied to Mario's facing angle, and it's used in most situations when he's walking, running, jumping, diving, most of Mario's action. And so the second one is the sliding speed. This one is a vector, so it has an X and a Z component, and it's used when sliding. And um, so either uh, whatever form of sliding that uses that vector. And so uh, usually at any given time, there's only one of two speeds that are currently being used by the game. And so the other one is always updated to match the one that is currently used. So the horizontal speed matches the sliding speed, and the sliding speed matches the horizontal speed. Uh, in most cases, it's a very, uh, very uh, straightforward, very simple system that works until you introduce the third way, the, third uh, the 3D vector. Uh, this one is used when Mario is swimming or flying. And their horizontal speed does update to match it, which works perfectly, but the sliding speed actually does not update. So the sliding speed sort of remains frozen at whatever it was last when Mario entered a state that used the 3D vector. You can see here, the horizontal speed when Mario is swimming is 22.5. That's a normal number. The sliding speed is 2.1 million in each direction, or about 3 million total speed, because uh, he managed to conserve that speed from when he exited the stage directly into a state of swimming, the sliding speed does not get updated. So when Mario exits the water, you can see the sliding speed is about 3 million. As soon as he leaves the water, he reactivates that speed because he enters a sliding state, and so now he has the 3 million speed. Now, the next question becomes, uh, once you have that much speed, where does Mario go, right? Um, the answer is just about here. Over there is the uh, map of the castle grounds in very small, and over here is Mario. This is after 1 30th of a second, by the way. Uh, so he goes pretty far. He enters a parallel universe. Now we're getting into uh, concepts that are a little more complicated. I actually made a video that explains this task, and it takes 40 minutes to do it, so I'm trying to uh, keep everything to a more basic level here. But a parallel universe is essentially an integer overflow. The game, uh, when it tries to find a floor under Mario, the floor detection function, uh, it converts the position into an integer. That creates a problem because uh, usually the, the, it's, it's fine because uh, the map is always contained within the range of an integer. But if you go very far, then uh, your integer will overflow, and then the game will think that there's a floor under you where there actually isn't. And so essentially what it does in practice is it sort of creates infinite copies of the main map. 
where the game thinks you're in the main map, but you aren't. So these are called the uh, parallel universes. So this is the main map over here, and then the darker ones, those would be all the ones where if Mario were to be in this area, the game thinks that he's on the floor, but he actually isn't. Uh, but the, uh, the most uh, important thing to keep in mind is that this is only the floor detection. So there, that means the parallel universes basically only have floors. They don't have walls, they don't have objects, and they don't have water. So the problem with entering the mode door, as we saw, the problem is Mario can't open the door if he's underwater. Uh, but parallel universes, they have no water. So uh, interacting with the door when you're walking into it, even if you're uh, entering water at the same time, the interaction with the door when you walk into it takes priority over entering the water. And finally, the solution, if you walk into the door, but coming from a parallel universe, you can walk into the door, you can trigger that interaction, and before the game realizes that Mario is underwater and he can't open the door, too late, Mario is opening it. Um, Afterward, uh, after this, we're going to see uh, a bit of a view, uh, four different views of what's going on in slow motion. It still goes by a little quickly. I don't have time to explain everything that goes behind it, but it was a huge optimization problem, and getting it to go by as fast as it did was a very, very difficult uh, endeavor. Uh, but uh, here's basically what's going on. So there are four different views. You can see Mario is going to be navigating into the parallel universes and then walks into the door and opens it. Uh, so especially the one on the top right, that's the relative view. So that's the Mario's relative position if uh, based on the floor detection. And so he can walk into the door uh, coming from an area where there's no water, but there is a floor. So uh, that was a bit of an idea of how complex the optimization problem can become. Uh, again, that's just a very small part of the task, uh, about, what, 15 seconds of it. The task is four minutes. So uh, yeah. Uh, the third example is uh, some crazy possibilities that a task can unlock. Uh, this one is a little, uh, a little different because we're going to be seeing Super Mario Bros. 3, and this is a credits warp. It, it's an exploit that was found using uh, emulators and RamWatch, so by tool-assisted speedrunners. Uh, those are the people who did the research. But the exploit is actually possible to do in real time using a real controller, and so it's used in real-time speedruns and tool-assisted speedruns as well. And essentially, it's going to reach a princess in only three minutes. Whereas if you're using warp whistles normally, you can take about 11 minutes to beat the game. Uh, so um, we're going to see what's going on here. But uh, it's, uh, it's going to look a little weird until we explain what's going on. So the first thing Mario does is he's going to play some Koopas. He's going to manipulate the enemies, and he's going to place Koopa shells in very precise positions. <clears throat> so this Koopa shell is in a very specific position, and finally the last one. And then he's going to clip into the side of a pipe. That lets him enter it backwards, and then what's going on here, after a bit of fast forward, uh, this is the end. Now don't blink. Hello, princess. So there it is. Uh, that's three minutes into the run. Uh, this is, uh, I think it's a former record now, but it's a three minutes and two seconds speed run. Uh, very close to the perfect time. Uh, but um, yeah, so what happened? I think that's a question on everybody's mind. Um, essentially, uh, pipes are made up of tiles. So this is uh, each, uh, the pipe is made of eight, uh, eight tiles here. So these are normal pipe tiles. And at the bottom and at the top, those are pipe exit tiles. Uh, so they have a different code in the, in the game's code. And uh, Mario it basically tells the game that Mario can enter those tiles to enter a pipe. Uh, there's a glitch in the game that lets you, uh, it's the same glitch as we saw in Super Mario Bros. 1 that lets you wall jump. Uh, you can clip inside the side of a block sometimes. And if you time it right, and it's, if you're positioned right, you can enter the pipe exit tile, but from the other side. When you do that, uh, you, you take the pipe backwards, and then that sends you outside of the bounds of the level and into what we call garbage data. Essentially, the level has a table where it holds all the information, but if you go outside of that table, it's just going to read whatever other data is there. Um, and so uh, that essentially leads you into a place that uh, is rendered uh, differently, but should look like this if it was rendered properly. 
Uh, so over here is a tile that is treated as a pipe exit. So that lets Mario exit the pipe into the garbage data. And over here is a block that just happens to be a, uh, an invisible node block. And when you hit a node block, the game uh, temporarily changes the tile, and so it, it writes data to change what the tile is. But the problem is now you're reading data that's in a location of the game that you can't actually change the data. It's in a part of ROM, which is read-only memory. Um, essentially, that crashes the game. There are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, different steps, but eventually the uh, execution is uh, headed in a space where variables are head. Uh, so this is zero page RAM. Those are very uh, variables that are used very often by the game. So a lot of them, uh, as you can see here, positions of enemies, Mario, different blocks and power-ups. So these are a bunch of variables. And now they're being treated as assembly operations. Um, this is not good. <laughs> so what you're trying to do next is you're trying to uncrash the game. Because when the game is reading those instructions, it's reading nonsense. But if you have some clever uh, arrangement of variables, you can maybe control them in a way that essentially tells the game uh, an execution. So what you're uh, seeing here is highlighted. Uh, this is the uh, horizontal position on the screen of three different Koopa shells. So the manipulation you saw before uh, placed those Koopa shells at pixel perfect positions on the screen. And then that essentially wrote the instruction jump to whatever memory address. Uh, so the memory address, 8FE3, uh, essentially is where the subroutine that, lo that loads the ending is located. So the game essentially reads Koopa shells as if it was cold. Uh, Koopa shells tell them, hey, you should load the ending now. And so it does that. Um, but now we, uh, we have the question, the Koopa shells here can be anywhere on the screen. So if they can be anywhere, you can do anything with that line of code. What happens when you can execute any instruction you want? Essentially, what's going on is you have a genie, and the genie grants you a single wish. What do you do when a green, uh, genie grants you one wish? Well, of course, you ask for more wishes. Uh, so this is arbitrary code execution. This is uh, the ultimate thing you can do with a task, the ultimate way to break the game. So the first step, you write an instruction in a specific part of memory. In this case, that was the Koopa positions. Then you abuse a memory glitch to execute that instruction. In that case, that was going out of the bounds of the map, uh, hitting a node block that crashes the game and eventually leads the instruction into that part of memory. Third step, uh, this is where it's a little different. Your instruction, you're going to write something that's going to tell the game to instead read the controller inputs as if it was code. And so after that, you can take over the world. Um, so here's an example where the idea is basically the same, uh, but at the end, it's going to be something different. I want you to pay attention at the bottom here. Uh, this is the inputs for controllers one and two. And while this is happening, the uh, tasser is essentially reprogramming the game, but using the, uh, the, the programming language is now the NES controller. Now this is what you can do with it. So, um, Ace is possible in a bunch of different games. This is just a small sample, but typically older games on the NES, SNES, Nintendo 64, uh, just a few examples. Uh, there's about 20 that I know of, uh, but yeah. Um, one, uh, one other Ace example I wanted to show you is uh, basically like the most crazy thing you can do. Uh, it's on, on a Super Nintendo, so keep in mind this is a console from uh, 1990, and this is what they're gonna do with it. So first of all, a bit of setup. They had to take a few minutes to set up the glitch to have arbitrary code execution. And now this is what they're going to do with it. So this was at a live event, um, Awesome Games on Quick 2017. I'm sure you guys have seen this game before. They showcased this. And uh, afterwards, this is what they did with it. So this is a live video call. Ladies and gentlemen, James Chen. So yeah, 
essentially what they did is they fed the game uh, video and audio information through the controller, uh, the con controller inputs. Um, now, to get through all of this, you need to do uh, the part of glitch hunting. And this is where the second section comes into, uh, where glitch hunting can be uh, more scientific than you think. Uh, so what is glitch hunting? Uh, it's, it's essentially finding the glitches in the game. And so what you're going to do is you're going to try to reverse engineer the code by experiencing the code. Uh, in some uh, much older games, sometimes the code is completely disassembled, but usually that's not the case. So you only have the finished product, and you're trying to figure out what's going on. And so to do that, uh, you, and then you want to apply the knowledge to improve the speedrun. That's the basis idea. But to do that, you're going to uh, use a scientific method. And so we're going to see a little bit of what that means. Uh, glitch hunting with the scientific method, essentially you have an initial observation. Usually that's someone who finds something weird in the game and you try to, you know, it's odd behavior, you try to explain it. Uh, what you're going to do is first a hypothesis, uh, maybe, you know, could be explained like this or that, and then you try to experiment with it and try to find if that's true or not. And then using that, you formulate your theory and finally you apply your theory. It's essentially the scientific method, but applied to uh, finding glitches in a game. So the initial observation, for example, could be something like this. When Mario is normally kicking, uh, doing a wall kick on a wall, he turns around. But sometimes he doesn't turn around. He keeps going forward. So this is weird. This is odd behavior. We're going to try to see a little bit of how that works. So the hypothesis, maybe Mario is going so fast that he's sort of moving through the wall because he's going fast enough, and then he bounces from behind the wall. That could be an explanation. But as we can see, even with a low speed, you can still get that weird kick. And even if you have a high speed, sometimes that kick is not possible. So the hypothesis is disproved. Now what you want to try is something else. If you try uh, the corner, so if you're directly in the corner, you can do that trick. But if you're not exactly in a corner, then it doesn't work. So it seems like corner has something to do with it. Um, so then you try to vary the angle. If Mario is very parallel to the wall, then his exit angle will be slightly different. And if he's not parallel, then he's going to come off at another angle. So as you can see here, um, the angle that Mario reflects on is actually the left wall here instead of the wall that he's supposed to be kicking. So this is essentially what we've managed to gather from our testing. So from there, we can refine that theory and we can understand it better uh, by doing some other tests. Uh, so for example, if Mario is pushing against the wall, um, if he's in the corner, then one of the two walls, he won't be able to push against it. He'll be running against it instead. Essentially, Mario can only interact with a single wall at a time. Um, so the, whatever first wall is treated will get overwritten by the second one. So the first wall becomes unreferenced, and the second wall is the wall that's referenced. And the, the glitchy wall kick happens when you try to wall kick a wall that's going to be uh, overwritten by the second one. And so Mario will, uh, Mario's angle re will reflect off the second wall. And so you can uh, see it can happen in a bunch of places where two walls intersect where Mario's exit angle from the wall kick will be different from what you would expect. So any single corner in the game uh, between two walls, one of them you can do the glitchy wall kick, and the other you can't. And finally, when you, once you apply that knowledge, you can apply the discovery. This is a tool-assisted speedrun of one star in the game, and it's going to use the glitchy wall kick uh, right about now. There it is. And so it gets the star in only 10 seconds. Uh, and also a little bit of real-time speedruns use them, but it's a bit of a finicky trick, so usually it's reserved for passive. Um, so again, I wanted to draw a little parallel with scientific studies. Uh, glitch hunting, as we saw, uses a bit of the scientific method. And uh, when you're really invested in the game that you're speedrunning or glitch hunting for, discovery can feel pretty inspiring and pretty empowering because you're discovering new things about a game that maybe the game came out 25 years ago, uh, millions of players played it, and you're finding something for the first time. Uh, but generally, it's a relatively low investment of time and effort, especially since we're going to compare it with uh, science. And then the results are fun, but ultimately meaningless, because you know, you're just finding glitches in the game. But it's still a pretty fun thing to do. Uh, in comparison, scientific discovery, basically the same thing. Uses the scientific method. Discovery is inspiring and empowering, maybe a little bit more than glitch hunting, but uh, it, it's definitely a, a similar, uh, similar feeling when you're discovering new things. Uh, but it's an extremely high investment of time and effort. 
you know, people can sometimes spend decades re researching certain things and never really get to, uh, to results. Uh, and the results are obviously a lot more meaningful and they can still be fun. And uh, so that's why, in my opinion, that uh, there are many ways in which speedrunning is a bit of a toy model of science endeavors. Um, so as we saw, it's a pretty fun way of doing science. Uh, it's a small scale version of the scientific method, but again, it still uses a lot of scientific concepts, especially when you're doing passing, you're doing these complicated uh, optimization problems. And uh, glitch hunting, when you're doing it, feels like you're doing science. You're really trying to understand the way the game works and you're trying to discover it. And uh, finally, most adult speedrunners do have a background in science. A lot of speedrunners are uh, software engineers. It's a very popular, it's a very popular one in the speedrunning world. But there's also a bunch of uh, people in the in scientific studies in general, uh, like in mathematics or doctors. Uh, I know a bunch of different scientists, uh, civil engineers, a bunch of uh, people in the STEM fields, basically. And so uh, this is why, in my opinion, uh, speedrunning can act as a sort of an indirect educational tool. It can teach people how to use science in a way that they wouldn't expect it would be useful. I expect some of you have been reading the comment. I, I've, I've been getting this kind of comment a lot on my videos, where people are essentially saying, my parents thought I wouldn't learn anything playing video games, but uh, jokes on them, this video is uh, going get to get me my PhD in uh, game physical Mariology next week. Um, so essentially what I'm saying is, uh, Speedrunning, uh, it looks like uh, just a waste of time or a hobby that doesn't lead to anything, but uh, when you're actually really serious about it, uh, you can use a lot of scientific, uh, uh, you know, scientific methods and scientific uh, uh, notions to achieve your goals. That's it. I hope everyone enjoyed. If you have any questions, I'm still available for questions. <laughs>
I've also seen a bunch of your videos, um, also cool. But I'm Thanks. not that much into the speedrunning scene. I do watch a lot of Trickmania, however, and you mentioned that as well. And there was a, a mild cheating scandal last year. Maybe you heard of it. Yes, um, I have. <laughs> so I was wondering, is there a, a anti-cheating agreement in the speedrunning community or um, anything um, in that direction? Well, the speedrunning community as a whole is really large. So in reality, what you see is more like it's made up of a bunch of smaller communities that you know, talk to each other, but are typically contained to one game. So each game typically has moderators. Uh, I'm, like, I'm personally a moderator of uh, Donkey Kong 64, Super Mario Brothers. So those are run by a group of people who know the game really well, who have been in the speedrunning community for long, and uh, it really varies per game. Typically, a more competitive game will have uh, more uh, strict requirements for uh, when you're submitting your times. Uh, a lot of them will require video proof, so you need some way to, uh, at the very least, film your TV while you're playing the game, but uh, you can also get capture equipment. Um, cheating is a thing that happens everywhere, everywhere, I think, and the idea behind speedrunning basically mostly has just bragging rights. Uh, in the case of Trackmania, that's a little, a little different because it, it was a professional player as well, so he was making money off of uh, the records he was setting. But uh, essentially, uh, the idea is basically um, if, if you're cheating in a way that's undetectable, then it's undetectable and there's nothing we can do about it. But usually, almost every time, there's going to be one mistake somewhere. There's going to be some imperfection. Uh, one popular way of cheating, especially back in the days, was called splicing, where you were doing the, segment, the speed run in short segments, and then you would use a video editor to just put all of them together and then put a splice wherever it's undetectable. But in the background noise, there's the, the uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, fluctuations. And then when there's the cut in that, that's when you can tell there's a splice. So all of those old speed runs were eventually found out as being spli spliced. Uh, so yeah, that stuff can happen. But uh, usually, it's a lot of uh, honor system. Depending on, depending on the size of the game, uh, it can go from uh, pretty much everyone will believe you until they don't uh, to uh, you have to have pretty good video proof and a really good standard of proof, if, especially if you're competing for world records in uh, highly competitive games. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. And my question was, uh, if you had any idea about how we could use DAS in like a game like Minecraft, because I think I've seen uh, them using DAS to uh, set world records on like random seed worlds. So the levels in Minecraft basically is a random world and you can't really give it preset um, controls. So if I was wondering if you had any um, idea on such games. Um, for this specific example, I think I've actually not heard of it. Uh, I've seen a task of Minecraft where the seed is set and then the sequence is played back. And I think the game is beaten in seconds. It's pretty crazy. Um, but um, uh, I mean, personally, I haven't really been uh, very involved in Minecraft speedrunning recently. Uh, I used to actually speedrun Minecraft many, many years ago, before it was cool, in fact. Um, <laughs> because uh, I, I was sort of like the de facto world record holder in that game uh, uh, in any percent set seed where the seed was known and the world was known in advance. Uh, but back in the days, there was basically no competition. So I was, you know, the world record holder. But really, what, like, who does it matter to? Um, but uh, yeah, recently, I haven't really been involved with Minecraft much. So I don't know exactly how they do it. But I can tell you that uh, tool-assisted speedruns on PC games uh, is still growing, and the problem with it is it's, it's not as simple as uh, consoles, uh, especially older consoles that have emulators, have very sturdy tools that you can use to simulate the game really precisely and do a bunch of stuff to help you do the task, but PC games typically don't have that. And so you sort of have to build your own tools, and they have to be custom-made for every game. So it's most likely a tool that was specifically built for Minecraft and that's only usable in Minecraft. Uh, I don't know about that tool specifically. I know a little bit about the tool used in Trackmania where essentially 
it replicates all the, uh, the tools I was talking about where you can slow the game down and you can use save states. And essentially you're writing what is sort of a macro where you're telling the game at each, uh, you're telling a game like a timestamp in milliseconds and then uh, a steering input, like how much you steer uh, left or right. And then if you're thr throttling or braking. So that's how it works in Trackmania. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know more about the Minecraft task. Okay, so what, one more question from Slack from Markus. How do the vendors actually react to the speedruns? Um, so do they like the automation and, that, and finding bugs, glitches? So do they put any specific hurdles up? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed just oh, a couple of words. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, do, how do the vendors react to the speedruns and uh, using the automation? So do, do they like this? Do they put any specific hurdles to avoid that using? And oh, also oh, you from mean the legal side, um, do they like the free advertising? There's a, there's a couple uh, videos out there of uh, developers of a game reacting to the speedrun, and it's usually pretty, uh, pretty funny to see. It's uh, usually a bewilderment, amazement. Uh, essentially, uh, in modern games, there's a different approach because speedrunning has grown so much that it's now like a pretty significant part of the gaming uh, community as a whole. And so there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of developers that cater to speedrunners in some ways. Some ways work better than others, uh, but essentially uh, a lot of games nowadays are, uh, uh, have some speedrun mode where there's a timer, like an in-game timer and a way to like skip cutscenes or whatever. So uh, this is uh, something that developers have done in recent years. Um, and another thing that developers do sometimes with recent games is that games are no longer on a cartridge that once you sell it and that's how it is, that that's how people will play it. If it has bugs, it will have them forever. Uh, nowadays, uh, games can be patched, games can have updates. And so sometimes a very cool speedrunning trick is found, but it kind of breaks the game a little too much. Developers don't like that, and so they patch it, and a month later, you can no longer do the trick. And so that can cause a little bit of uh, issues when you're trying to moderate the game. You're wondering, should we use this version or that version? Because usually the first release of a game is the one that has the most tricks in it. Um, and so that's usually the release that people will be trying to use to speedrun. Because typically the fastest version is uh, it's what's preferred. Uh, but yeah, developers, uh, they, they're increasingly aware of speedrunning and uh, the, the reactions to it uh, can vary with uh, different studios. But in general, it's, uh, it's uh, something that's really appreciated because speedrunning is sort of like the ultimate love letter to a game because if you have to, if you want to actually subject yourself to playing the game 2,000 times, I think it's a good testament that you liked it. So is there, uh, we have time for one final question. Oh. If not, I think you made a perfect closing word. <laughs> and uh, thanks, uh, let's thank again our speaker for this nice, uh, for this interesting presentation. Thank you.